Hi everyone at North Coast. I have a prop today. I actually had to get an Uber to church today and I got in and the guy said, what is that? And I, he was worried. I said, silence, just take me to the pharmacy, I said. And he was a bit worried. Uh, but, <laughs> but he wanted to talk about Jesus. He was a Muslim taxi driver, an uh, Uber driver, and every Muslim Uber driver I've ever met wants to talk about Jesus. And that's what we're here to do today, to talk about Jesus and swing swords. So we'll do that in a minute. It's great to have you. It's great to have the kids. Thanks for giving your kids lots of sugar before the sermon. It's going to be a great 30 minutes. <clears throat> if you're not a uh, regular here, we're in uh, the final week of a series called The King's Gambit. Uh, in 1 Samuel, the final week, and we get to a great story about David and Goliath. Who would have thought that we would have put the series together, that it would end on Easter Sunday with a story about David and Goliath? It's as if we had planned it, and that's what we've done. So we're going to read part of the story, and then I'm going to explain the story today. And the great thing about this series is we've seen God as king throughout the series. And if you have been coming here for the last couple of months, and you're still going, oh, I'm not convinced. Why not? Maybe this is the day to be convinced about the goodness of our king. So we're going to have on the screen, start of chapter 17, and uh, we'll read to verse 12, and then we'll go on from verse 24. Very famous story, so settle in for a little bit of it. You probably know a little bit of it off by heart. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah and Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had a bronze armour on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his spear shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, "'Why have you come out to draw up for battle?' Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. Verse 24. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, that's Goliath, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why have you come down? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Was it not a, but a word? And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. 
And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, so his worry, and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armour. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped his sword over his armour. And he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. So David put them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand." When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath, and killed him, and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout, and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sharaim as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine, and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armour in the tent. How about we pray and then we're going to look at this passage of scripture together. Father God, I pray that you will help us as we look at this. It's a story that's quite familiar in many ways, but I pray that we will hear it with eyes of understanding, ears that hear, that we see and hear what this is about and that it changes our lives. We thank you for Resurrection Sunday May your Holy Spirit, who raised Jesus from the dead, raise our hearts today also. Amen. Well, we're looking at the King's Gambit. This is the series, and it's the final one in the series, The Risen King. The Risen King. Now, the first time that we heard shouts and cries and the clash of metal on metal breaking a quiet Sunday morning outside our house, we raced outside. What was that? We wondered. There on the primary school oval, across the road, the Battle of Hastings was taking place. On the oval, fat men in tights, helmets, armour, shields, swinging swords. It was medieval cosplay at its finest. Now, we haven't seen it since COVID, by the way. They haven't been there. I think they all died of bubonic plague because they took things pretty seriously with their cosplay. Now, cosplay's fun, isn't it? Cartoon fighting, because no one really gets hurt. And the David and Goliath story is so familiar, so ingrained in us, that it feels and reads like cosplay. It feels like a cartoon. And there's plenty of cartoons out there if you Google it or you look on YouTube. It's great for kids. There's a hairy, scary giant. It should have been Matt preaching this sermon this morning. And there's a scrawny kid. And it's one of those Bible stories, isn't it? You know what I mean by one of those Bible stories? It's 
Joseph and his coloured coat. It's Noah and the ark, great for picture books. But reality, not so much, because it's got a cartoon image in our minds. And we use the term, that's such a David and Goliath story. Even if you're not a church person, you know what it means. The small shop owner versus the megaplex. The local club defeating Manchester United. The small town lawyer wins a litigation battle against a mining giant. David and Goliath is every Nike poster in every CrossFit box, willing you to crush your PBs. Yes, I'm looking at you. Except David and Goliath is not cosplay. David and Goliath is not a David and Goliath story. David and Goliath is the David and Goliath story. It's a true life and death story. There are no games being played. And today, Resurrection Sunday, as we wrap up this series, we're looking at this true life and death story and what it says about life and death and life for us. We're going to look at three ways. The ground war, which is where we started with our series, what's going on for Israel. The air war, what's going on above the chessboard. God is the chess master looking down at the chessboard. And then our war, what's going on for us. Ground war, air war, our war. Ground war. As you read the passage, the battle scene is set. The mist clears, and like a game of chess, two armies, one on this mountain, one on that mountain, empty space in the middle, where the battle will be fought, where the blood will be shed, where the bodies will fall. Yet something, or someone, is holding it up. A giant of a man, a Philistine soldier, taunting Israel's armies like Conor McGregor flexing before a fight. Look what it reads. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Victory, life and liberty. Defeat, death and enslavement. A stark choice. Servants of Saul, he says. At least Israel has a king. I mean, that's what they've been looking for all along. We want a king to lead us into battle. And how's that going? <laughs> when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. How's that king thing working out for you, Israel? Not so well. The story has moved on quickly since Saul's coronation. And Saul is immediately contrasted with someone else, someone new. Saul, and then who? Now David. Now David was the son of Etherthite of Bethlehem and Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the day of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. Eight sons, he's the youngest, from the backwaters, in Bethlehem. Saul, trembling and afraid, now David. <laughs> See the shift? David kind of turns up for other reasons, to bring food to his three brothers in the army, just at the right time, to hear this taunt. It's interesting in the Bible, the sheer number of just at the right time moments there are as you read through the story. It's stunning. It's as if God knows just the right time to turn up and save his people from death. Fancy that. Abraham is about to sacrifice his son Isaac on the mountain 
and has his hand like this with a knife in it, and at just the right time, the angel stays his hand in the book of Genesis. Israel slaves in Egypt, and at just the right time, God rescues them. And then the Egyptians are pursuing Israel as they leave Egypt. At just the right time, God parts the sea and delivers Israel to life. And if you're here today going, oh, that didn't happen. Well, at just the right time to ice the cake, God closes the waters again over the Egyptians, delivering them to death and Israel to life. You can argue how that happened, but it certainly happened at just the right time. And as we've come to the book of 1 Samuel, that has been no exception. At just the right time, Hannah, childless, in despair, prays. And God brings life, a son, Samuel, who is, in fact, just the right time for Israel, because in Israel in those days, there was no king and everyone did what was in, right in their own eyes. And God raises up Samuel to speak God's words to the nation. And now... David comes along at just the right time. See, God is a at just the right time God. That's Easter. How do we know it's Easter? Because the Bible says at just the right time in Romans. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous per person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That was the right time. There was not going to be a time where you were not a sinner and God, oh, well, they're all sorted out now. I'll, I'll die for them. At just the right time. And maybe today you need God's at the right time. Maybe like Israel, you are dismayed or you are greatly afraid and your struggle or anguish with sin is taunting you. At the right time, you are here this morning. At the right time. But, but back to the story. The at the right time guy looks like he's the wrong guy. <laughs> he's the youngest of eight sons. He has three older brothers who are soldiers. He is a mere shepherd, an errand boy, and his older brother Eliab doesn't want him to forget that. And he has to br bring provisions to the real men. Not much to see here about David. But as he arrives and talks with the soldiers, Goliath is flexing. Behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before, and David heard him. Speaking the same words as before, taunting God. But then something clicks. And here we get David's recorded words, the famous psalm writer of the Bible. And what are the, these words? They are words of war. But I want you to notice it's not just a ground war. It's not just about Israel there and the Philistines there. It's David that realizes there's an air war going on. Something bigger is happening. Look at verse 26. David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of Saul? No, the armies of the living God. This is an air war. Israel has been so busy with the chessboard down here, they have forgotten to look up. They have forgotten to look where their source of strength and power and victory would come from. The chess master. 
So busy with the visible battle, they have missed the invisible battle, but David has not. Who is this that defies the armies of the living God? Goliath's defiance is a challenge to God, a challenge to God's promises to bless Israel, a challenge to God's promise to increase them, a challenge to God's salvation plan. Killing Goliath is not about bragging rights, even though you're going to get the king's daughter, might want to check that out first, lots of money and no taxes. It's about worship. Who are you to defy the living God? David loves God, yet when Goliath approaches David, he curses David by his own gods. David loves God, loves God's glory, and will not see it mocked. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And this is crucial, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. The Hundred Years' War was pretty long. And it, want to guess how many years? The hundred, didn't actually go for 100 years, but that's different. But this air war that David is talking about, this cosmic battle between the forces of darkness and the holy, glorious God, much, much longer. Every other battle is within the context of this cosmic battle that the Bible lays out in its plan. Right from the start, Satan's evil desire is to kill and enslave humans, you, me, through sin and death. Rebellion against God and his glory is ingrained in our DNA. It enslaves us and will kill us, and that's the way Satan wants it. And God will not abide that. He is fighting a cosmic battle. This is bigger than Israel on this mountain and the Philistines on this mountain. And a hint of this, more than a hint, is found in the very description of Goliath's armour. Goliath's height is almost an afterthought. It's mentioned once what height he was, and then it spreads out the description of his armour. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, verse 5 to 7, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had bronze armour on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield-bearer went before him. Now, ours is a Star Wars house. Anyone? Now, this puts my age. I'm Jedi ancient. Uh, I saw the first movie when it first came out in 1977, when I was 10, with some other young people from church in the back of a combi van at the drive-ins. How special am I? That's amazing. People kill for that these days. It was awful. And my son loves the franchise, and he has taken a deep interest in each character's armour. He has books about the lightsabers and all the weaponry. And in a warring culture... Everyone takes interest in the armour, and Israel was no exception. But here's what it says that the giant was wearing. It says a coat of mail. A coat of mail. Literally, in the original, this is the only time I'll say it, about the original language, it says this, a suit of scales. Goliath was wearing a suit that looked scaly. He's a scaly one. And where have we met a scaly one in this battle, this cosmic battle, before? Where have we met something scaly invading God's land, mocking God, bringing death to God's people? The serpent slithers into the garden and mocks God. Did God really say? And fear and death fall on Adam. And then from Adam, 
hemorrhaging to us all. And David sees this as the next step in the cosmic battle. And this shepherd king won't take it lying down. Indeed, to David, Goliath's mockery of God simply reduces him to animal status. It is subhuman to mock God, to reject him. When you hear of fantastic beasts in the Bible story, it's a sign that humans are living less than humanly. They are refusing to give God the glory that humans should do. So Saul expresses surprise that David could beat this battle-hardened brute, and David replies that he's killed bears and lions. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. God has delivered David from beastly types in the past. He will do it again. Now, as I'm saying all this, perhaps for you, the Bible is just a bunch of David and Goliath stories, fairy stories. But bear with me. Imagine a storyline so big and complex, yet so focused, that it took a whole book this size and this long to tell it. A storyline that gets bigger and clearer the further we read into it. Wild promises, budding themes that start to take shape and weight and form as we read through the story, layers of meaning piling up. And imagine if the spine of that story was this. God will raise up a king, a deliverer, to rescue humans from the enemy in this cosmic battle. He will raise up a king, not to oppress people, but to shepherd them to safety, who will destroy the scaly serpent who has enslaved us to sin and a fear of death. Imagine a story like that, and as the story progresses and the focus sharpens, as God constantly rescues people from those who would enslave and kill, it just gets sharper and sharper and sharper, until at last the story reaches a wondrous conclusion, an ultimate shepherd king, a good shepherd, an ultimate rescue act from slavery and death. Welcome to Easter Sunday. A book in the Bible called Hebrews explains how Jesus is that true king. He is the reality of which David, the king, the rescuer, was pointing to. These words from Hebrews chapter 2 in the New Testament. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he, that's Jesus, himself, likewise partook of the same things, that through death... He might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. What does that mean? It means Jesus is God's shepherd king, come to rescue humans by dying on a cross by destroying the scaly one who enslaved us to the fear of death. And back in the garden at the start of the story, God promised humans that your offspring will crush the serpent's head. God points to a future where a future human will destroy this terrible work of slavery and death that the scaly one has brought. And David, he's the king's gambit. He's the next move on the chessboard of God. He responds to Goliath's taunts. He refuses Saul's armor. Saul, the impotent king who lost his spiritual battle years ago, tries to fit David with his own armor. He just doesn't get it. David fights Goliath with sling and stone, not sword and spear. Why? Because he says it. The battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. David proves it so, crushing the serpent's head with a stone and then cutting off his head in further proof 
of God's promises in the garden. The battle is the Lord's. He raises up a rescuer who will crush the serpent's head. He delivers his people from slavery and death. Good Friday delivered us from slavery to sin. Easter Sunday delivers us from slavery to death. Death dies. If you're battling sin or fear or despair, the prospect of something dying in your life, even death itself, here is your liberty, your hope. You are not David in this story, fighting your giants. We are fearful Israel, powerless to save ourselves. And Israel did not lift a finger to win their freedom. Their shepherd king won the battle on their behalf. Our shepherd king has won the battle on our behalf at the cross and the tomb. That's ground war and air war. And to land it, our war. And perhaps you ask, that, well, how's this about us? This is a David and Goliath story. How's it my story? John Harris is a UK writer and journalist, and he wrote this during Easter week in the Guardian newspaper. When my partner and I filled in our census form, we got to the section about faith. Both ticked the no religion box and seemed to think nothing of it. But for an hour or two afterwards, I felt a pang of envy that has occasionally surfaced in the past, this time to do with a year of lockdown, the sudden fear of serious illness and death, and the sense of all of it being wholly random and senseless. Like millions of other faithless people, I have not even the flimsiest of narratives to project onto what has happened, nor any real vocabulary with which to talk about the profundities of life and death. When it comes to death, when it comes to COVID, when it comes to things being destroyed, he's got nothing. You have to admire his honesty, don't you? Post-religious people in the West, technologically advanced, socially progressive, certain of so much, educated beyond the dreams of our parents, information at our fingertips, struck dumb by death. Secular life will prepare you for so much. Career, relationships, experience, pleasure. But when it comes to death, it has failed us. It has nothing to say. We work and play and shop make plans, then suddenly this brutal, scaly giant stomps into view, shouting and mocking and cursing. We thought death was far off on the horizon, a, a hazy figure, a long way away, she is away yet, not all that big, then suddenly he's there, looming and large with taunts about cancer or car crashes or suicide, dementia, mocking us. And like Israel, we shrink back in fear and trembling with all our hopes and dreams dissolving. Harris is honest and right. We just don't have the words to talk about death. I think we talk least about the things we fear most. <laughs> and there's a word for that, denial. Denial. I remember waiting for a biopsy on my pancreas at RPH a few years ago, 10 years ago after a bad diagnosis. Sitting, waiting to get wheeled in, two men either side of me, one in his early 60s with advanced pancreatic cancer, sitting there with his wife, is having a stent put in, a vain attempt to halt the inexorable tumour. And his wife was rattling these bottles of pills. And she said to me, we've got some hope left. And on the other side of me was an old, frail man with his portable oxygen tanks with him. And he asked me what I was there for. And I told him, and then I said, I'm 43. I don't want to die just yet. And he said to me, I'm 83. And I still don't want to die. 
43, early 60s, 83, younger, older, whatever age you are, the giant stands and taunts us. And his record going into battle with everyone, percentage? 100%. David and Goliath is no cosplay. It is no cartoon. This is real. Today, tomorrow, one day, that's how it feels. We are dumb before it. We have no vocabulary. And then a voice behind us a voice that calms our fears, a voice that says, truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Jesus, the true and better shepherd king, steps around us, steps in front of us, and stares down the mocking giant and he's about to deliver the final blow. He just looks that giant in the face and says, shh, shh. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. A stone, not slung this time, rolled away. And the angel says to the women at the tomb, the place of the dead, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen. And Jesus strides back from the battlefield to the joy of God's people, holding up a bloodied, scaly head in one hand, the giant's sword in the other. Here is the ultimate answer to Hannah's prayer way back in chapter 2 of our Samuel story. The Lord kills and brings to life. The Lord kills and brings to life. And Jesus strides out of the tomb, casts his burning gaze at the battlefield and utters the final words of our series, The King's Gambit. Checkmate. Checkmate. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the resurrection, the hope in the midst of our fear of death, we know that we have a great king, a shepherd king who steps in front of us and slays the giant and gives us hope. May we go from here rejoicing in the liberty and life you've won for us in the Lord Jesus.